Um, this morning, though, let's grab our Bibles. We're going to be in Romans, and that's where we're going to be. So we're going to be going through Romans. Um, and today, the title of the message is Sharing the Gospel in Your Home. Um, one of the things that uh, I, I thought about today uh, as we as celebrate Mother's Day and all the moms that are here, we are so grateful and so thankful um, that you are here. And mothers usually always play a big role uh, in their children's faith. And what I mean by that is they play a big role, whether positive or negative. Um, and we want to see that mothers in our church play a positive role, right, uh, in their children's faith. When you go back and look through, like the New Testament, and you look at the book of First Timothy, you see that Lois and Eunice, that was Timothy's mother and grandmother, played this huge role um, in his faith. And, and though I biblically believe um, that it is the father's responsibility to lead that home and to lead out, it does not say that this, that does not mean that the mother has no responsibility. In fact, usually in the early years, and some might argue that those are the more, most important years, in those early years, the mother um, has a bigger impact usually than the dad. Uh, as the mothers are raising these children up, as they are nurturing them, as they are praying over them, and they're breathing scripture into them. And in our culture, one of the things that I've seen that is not a good thing is mothers and fathers alike, homes, are relying on the church to spiritually raise their children. And I want you to understand today that's unbiblical. The responsibility to bring your children to faith, to introduce them to the gospel, to share the gospel in your home, falls on the responsibility of the parents. But the problem is so many parents think that they're insufficient, that they, that they don't know enough, that, that, they, that they, need, they, they, they need to take them to the pastor, need to take them to the youth pastor, need to take them to the children's pastor, take them to somebody at the church that, that is better equipped to be able to share the gospel with their child. And you know whose fault that is? That's the church's fault. That is the church's fault. We need to do a better job equipping you to go and to share the gospel in your homes. And so today, that's what I wanted to do. I said, you know what? When I think about Mother's Day, what kind of gift can I give these mothers? What kind of gift can I, can I put into these homes? And I want to put the gift of the word into your home today. So one of the reminders I want to give you. Now, when I think of Mother's Day, I think of reminders because moms are always, right? They're always good at reminders, reminding you don't forget your lunch. You know, don't forget to brush your teeth before you go to bed. Don't forget to pray before you go to sleep. That, that's mom. They're, they're really good. So one of the reminders I want to give you this morning is the Romans Road. I want, to, I want to make sure it's clarified, and I want you to use it as a tool. Now, are there other tools in sharing the gospel? Absolutely. Absolutely. We know that the word of God does not return void. We're reminded that in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ Jesus our Lord. That's how, that's how we come to faith. We, we receive the word. We receive that word that Christ died on the cross for our sins and rose again. And that through him there is life. And so I want you to be equipped. So I want to also remind you that in our app, there's always sermon notes. All right. Hopefully, whenever somebody steps up here to preach, they put those notes into the app or they talk to somebody and say, hey, here's some notes. So today, you've got the Romans Road outlined in your sermon notes inside your app. Um, and they'll be there all week long, right? So even, even today, as you might have your Bible, you go through highlighting as we talk and discuss these scriptures and how they impact our life. You can go back this week. You can open up, go to events, and then you open up sermon notes, and then you'll have them right there, and you'll have the Romans Road. But this is one of the evangelical tools that I have always used. I use this tool on my children. I've used this tool as a pastor and as a youth pastor. In fact, I can remember thinking back um, as a young, and I mean young, green youth pastor, um, the, being equipped with the Romans Road and the impact that it made. And I remember going to like a youth evangelism conference. It's the first event as a youth leader I had ever taken any students to. 
And we showed up to this event, and I had like maybe six students. It was We were in a little church, and I was just volunteering. And, and so I had these six students with me. And so then at the invitation, they did something. They said, would all the, the pastors and youth leaders come forward and stand right up here? Very similar to what we do at the end of the service. You know, a lot of times the, the pastors and our wives and our elders will, will just sort of stand up here around the room. For if you have prayer or if you're, if you're making a decision today, we want to talk to you about it. And so they called us all down and I was going down there and listen, not only was I green, but I was a little bit unchurched. Not sure what they were about to do, but I'd seen an invitation before. And all of a sudden, he began to give this invitation and he started to ask these kids, today, if you're here and you'd like to receive Christ, you'd like to talk to somebody about receiving Christ, would you raise your hand? And then, I mean, hands going up all over the room. You know, I mean, there was probably only six or six or eight youth leaders that are up there. And I'm looking around thinking, this is a lot of kids, right? They've all got their hands up. And, and so, you know, anxiety began to build because I had actually never at this point walked somebody through the gospel. I've never, you know, I've never introduced somebody to Christ and to his word. And, and so I'm like, what is going on here? What am I going to do? And all of a sudden... Those hands that were raised went from, okay, now put your hand down, and I want you to go up there and grab one of these leaders, and they're going to lead you to the Lord. And I thought, oh, man, well, first of all, what I've learned throughout history now, and I don't ever lead anybody to the Lord, the Holy Spirit, I said, right? Thank God for the Holy Spirit, because I did not know what I was doing in that moment. But what happened was I had two young boys. I don't remember their names. I don't even remember, they weren't even from my church come up to me. And we went to sort of this little back corner and we sat down, knelt down, and I'm like, okay, okay, what do I do, what do I do? And immediately the Holy Spirit stirred up in my heart the scriptures I had memorized as a teenager in the Romans Road. And those scriptures came alive. I'm sure that I butchered them to death as I was fumbling through the word and trying to figure out how to tell. But God used that. Through his spirit, through his word, those two young men made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. Not because of what Craig did, but because of what the spirit of God did and what the word did. And so as, as, a, as families, as you go home and you get nervous sometimes when your kids begin to ask you questions. Now, yes, so they're going to ask you some hard questions, and sometimes you might have to say, well, let's go talk to Pastor Craig about that. And that's okay. But when it comes to salvation, when it comes to introducing them to the gospel, I want you to be prepared. And so today, I'm going to walk you through the Romans road um, and, and how I would probably, sitting down with somebody that is an unbeliever, looking and seeking to know Christ, this is what I would walk them through. And so we jump in this today. We look, how can I share the gospel at home? We realize it starts with scripture. And the scripture we're going to use today is the Romans road. And so the first question uh, is we're asking, well, so what do I do with this? The first thing that we want our children or whoever are presenting the gospel to, to the well, first thing we want them to understand is who God is and who they are. Who God is and who they are. And the, the way that I do this through the Romans road is I take them immediately to Romans chapter 3, verse 23. And in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, get it? That's your, that's your first street that you're turning on. That's the, that's the first place that you go. Romans 3, 23 is very simple, and it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we, we learn from just that little bitty scripture right there that all have sinned. Like, the, the, there's no one, there's no one that physically lives in this world that does not sin. By nature, that's what we just want to do, is we want to sin. And, and there's no one except for Jesus, who can live a sinless life. And so we look at this, and the scripture says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And in that we learn that it is God that is on this pedestal. 
It, it, is, the, it is his glory, his, his holiness, his perfection. That is the standard. And every one of us falls short. There, there, there's this holy God of all creation that created every man and every woman that has ever existed. And this God who is holy and perfect, and that is his standard, we all fall short. That, that means no matter where you are in life, no matter how good of a person the world may consider you, you fall short. It doesn't matter if you're a murderer or the world would consider you a saint. They both fall short of God's glory, of God's perfection, of his holiness. And so we're reminded as we look back in history that it is this God, the God of all creation, that we see in Genesis chapter 1, that he created the heavens and the earth and everything in this world. It is that God that desires a relationship with us. And we see it from the very beginning, right? Us, we see us in the Garden of Eden. You know, there, pictured as Adam and Eve, the first humans. That's humanity. And they were created to walk with God, right? They, they, they were created and they walked with Him in the Garden. But as we, as we walk our way through the creation story, and we see that God creates the heavens and the earth and, and all that is in it in chapter 1. God creates man and he creates woman in chapter 2. And here they are in the garden, you know, enjoying everything that God had created. And the greatest thing that they enjoy is God's presence. That's the greatest thing that they enjoy. <laughs> Except sin enters the world. God gave them like one rule, right? Like, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat of that tree. And historically, we know that they couldn't live up to that. They, they, they failed. And, and in the midst of that failure, as, as Satan swoops in, as the, the shifty snake, the shifty serpent, and he tempts Eve and then Adam gets drugged into it. All of a sudden, the fall of humanity takes place. Sin enters the world. And everything now that God has created, everything that he has created is now marred by this sin. And immediately upon this sin, Adam and Eve begin to realize good and evil. And they committed evil against the most holy God. And that evil has now separated them. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 3 that they tried to sort of flee from God. They tried to hide from him. And on top of that, they covered their, their nakedness. Because they were naked, there was no need to cover themselves. There was no sin in the world. You could either say naked or naked, however you want to say that. But either way, they had no clothes on, right? Nothing. And they were separated now from God. They were hiding from him, but God... This, this God and who he is, this great God of love and pursuit, pursued them, right? He went after them. He hunted them down. He found them because they couldn't run from him. And yes, because of their sin, there were consequences. They were banished from the Garden of Eden. They were banished from the presence of God. But what we end up finding out through Scripture is, you know, death enters the world at that time. But you know what? They didn't die immediately, and they should have. God, God in, in, his, in all of who he is, he had every right to strike them down immediately. But what we see God do is instead of striking them down, he clothed them. He, in fact, he took the skin of an animal, and he made clothes for Adam and Eve. He clothed them. And so... The first thing that we want people to realize as we present the gospel to them is who God is and, and who we are. And who we are are sinners that fall short of his glory and who he is is this glorious, wonderful, perfect, and holy God. And we don't deserve his salvation, but because of this great love and mercy that he has, 
offers of salvation. And immediately in the garden, we begin to see the plan fold out. We begin to we begin to hear the gospel for the first time, I believe, in chapter 3 of Genesis. As, as God proclaims that Satan, though he has bitten the hill or will bite the hill of Jesus, Jesus will ultimately stomp on his head and kill him, destroying all of who he is. We, we introduce who God is and, and who we are. And so once somebody recognizes the fact that, way, I, I am a sinner, right? You're right. I mean, you know, whether I do a lot of good things or not, regardless of this, we've all sinned. I am a sinner. I fall short of God's glory. I'm separated from him, just like Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. And this God, this great God, this holy God, loves me. And this is what he's done for me. And I move on to Romans chapter 5, verse 8. And Romans chapter 5, verse 8 tells us that God, he demonstrated his love. And while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. This God of love, this God of mercy, this God of grace, though I am still a sinner, you see how they're both, one's pointing to God, saying God is love, the other points to me, I am a sinner undeserving of his love. But though I am undeserving, God still demonstrated his love. He poured it out in, in the person of Jesus, his son. And so God demonstrated his love. And while yet I am a sinner, while yet I am unworthy, while yet there is nothing I can do to save myself, God made a way. And he demonstrated his love. And while I am a sinner, Christ died for me. That's what Jesus did. We're, we're now reminded uh, of the, the sacrificial lamb, Jesus. We're, we're reminded in, in, in John chapter 1 as Jesus approaches, the, John the Baptist cries out, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The, the, this, is who, this is what God has done for us. He has demonstrated his love. He has laid it out. And while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. We're reminded in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, which is the next verse. And if you're going along now, we're at 323, 5A, 623, right? That the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. And so we sit down. With, with, with our family in front of us, our children in front of us, our grandchildren in front of us. We sit down and, and we explain that the wages of our sin, the consequences of our sin, that our sin must be paid for, and the wage of that is death. And not just a physical death, but a spiritual death. Spiritual death, separation from God, entered the world the moment that Adam and Eve sinned. It entered the world and marred everything, meaning now and forever we are separated from God because of our sin unless we can be reunited and reconciled with Him. But the wages of our sin is that death, that death that separates us, that death that keeps us, that death that kicked them out of the garden and ultimately Adam and Eve both experienced a physical death. They were separated from God, though that was the first spiritual death that we see. As they were removed from the Garden of Eden, they were no longer walking with God. They're no longer in His presence. That, that, that is missing now. And they need to be reconciled to Him. So how does, that, how does that happen? If the wages of my sin is death, and I'm totally separated from God because of this, what do I do? Well, it's not what you do. It's what God did. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. That gift of God is to unite you and reconcile you with God, to clothe you. Like, remember Adam and Eve, I told you we're clothed 
in the garden, the scripture tells us that when you become new in Christ, old things are passed away and all things become new and you are now clothed. In the righteousness of Christ, meaning God doesn't see you as this wicked, wicked sinner, but he sees you through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus. He sees you through that sacrifice. He sees you through that payment. The wages of sin is death and it has to be paid for. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. So we either choose death or we Choose life in Christ. That, that, that it's ultimately it. It is there. God says, here is the gift in my son Jesus. It is throughout his word. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. And so then we ask this question. How do we respond? How do we respond to the gospel? What, what, needs, what needs to take place now? Okay, I, I, I realize so uh, that I know and I realize that I am a sinner. I have fallen short of God's glory. And, and there's nothing I can do to, to make myself perfect. There's nothing I can do to make myself holy. That's the standard. The standard is this, Romans 3, 23, you know, that we fall short of his glory. His glory is the standard. And, and I know that he has demonstrated his love. And while I'm a sinner and I don't meet that standard, I, I, I realize that Christ died for me. Christ bore my sin upon the cross rose on the third day just like he said he would having victory over death so that I can experience life. This is what God has done for me and, and then I know the wages of my sin is death. They, they, they've got to, to be paid for and they have to be paid for with death. And Jesus did that because the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. So Jesus paid the price. He, he paid the price. And God is, God is offering me this salvation. And we, we turn finally to Romans chapter 10. And we begin to look at, at verses 9 and 10. And in verse 9 it says that if you confess with your mouth that, that Jesus is Lord, I, I want you to understand that, that, that this, this sounds like simple, like because we, we all come together and we, we, we sing Jesus is Lord and we would even say, even probably before we were a Christian, that Jesus, Jesus is Lord. And what, what the scripture is really calling us to do in this moment what the, what the scripture is really pointing to is the fact that before Christ, the real Lord of our life is me. Like I, I'm trying to do everything to satisfy my urges, my flesh. I'm trying to do everything that I can to make me happy. And so when we look at this, we acknowledge the fact that if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, that, that I am nothing compared to him who has paid it all. I am nothing. He is Lord. And he has done this miraculous thing in conquering death on my behalf, paying for my sins upon the cross. <laughs> he is my Lord. He is the, the author of all creation. He was there, the scripture tells us, in the beginning, he is the beginning. And so we begin to look at this and it says, well, if you just confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, 
you will be saved. And immediately, that should grab your attention, right? As you hear the word, and it says that if you confess that Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. To, to just look at that, it sounds so simple, right? That I believe, right? And I receive. I, I believe and I receive. If I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, I no longer want to hold the throne of my heart. I give my life. I repent. Meaning I turn from the wicked things of this world and everything that I have desired. And I turn to Jesus who gave his life for me. I turn to him because he has done everything so that I can have life. And I believe it. In my heart, I believe it. That he truly died. He was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He ministered for three years upon the earth. Doing miraculous things. That had never been seen before. And he died. A criminal's death. A torturous death to take upon my sin and he rose again so I can have life and I believe that the Bible says that I'll be saved and you you continue to read and you continue to illustrate for with the heart a person believes resulting in righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation you notice that you can't just Say it. You've got to believe it. See, there's, there's been a big misconception within the church for years that if you just say it, it's enough. If you just say it, just repeat these words, that it's enough. Just say this prayer, and it's enough. But that's not what the scripture says. That's, that's not what the Bible says. I mean, Eve, I've even heard people use this text and say the same thing, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible does say that the confession is important, that you should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that with your confession, with your mouth, you confess unto salvation. But the real important part you look there is that you believe, that you believe that Jesus Christ truly is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for your sins, that he rose again. And you believe that in your heart that you can have life and have life through him and him only. And you believe that. The Bible says then you believe under righteousness. You know what that righteousness is? That is that righteousness makes you right with God. It brings you from death to life. It makes you right and reconciled with a holy, perfect God that you have been separated from because of sin. You are now made right with him because you believe not because of by what you say not because by what you say because many people have been fooled by preachers many people have been fooled by their grandfathers many people have been fooled by their dads and their moms and their Sunday school teachers that they, they said just repeat this prayer after me and everything will be okay and that's not what the Bible says the Bible says that you must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Believe in your heart that God has raised me from the dead and you will be saved. For with your heart, a person believes resulting in righteousness. With your mouth, you can, confession is made resulting in salvation. And in verse 11, for the scripture says, I want you to understand how important that is. Because every time you sit down with somebody and you present the gospel to them, it's because the scripture says... The foundation of what we believe is because the scripture says. And in verse 11, the scripture says, Whosoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is, in verse 12, there is no distinction between Jew or Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. And we're reminded 
that we look at that and to put it in East Texas terms, maybe and we see that there's no difference between the Jew or the Greek. We would probably say there's no difference between the religious and the pagan. Religion doesn't save you. There are, there, the Jews were the religious example and the Greeks were the pagans. And it is Jesus Christ that is Lord of all and he is the savior of all that will place their faith in him. There's no difference between the Jew or the Greek. There's no difference between the religious or the pagan. There's no difference between the churchgoer and the criminal. In fact, we're reminded in Romans chapter 2, verse 11, that God, not just in salvation, is not partial, but in his wrath, he's not partial. Like, it doesn't matter, the small or the great. If you don't have Christ, when you die and you enter into eternity, it doesn't matter how good you were. It doesn't matter how bad you were. It doesn't matter where you grew up or what you look like. God's not partial. You will feel his wrath if you do not know Christ. Preach it. That is the truth. And we look at this and we see what the word says. And in verse 13, we're reminded, and this is usually the last place I go, that for whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Whoever will place their faith in Christ will be saved. Whoever. That's what the scripture tells us. But what does that mean? Does that mean that if I just, if I say a prayer that the preacher told me to repeat, that everything is going to be good? No. What that means is that when you confess Jesus Christ as Lord, you believe, truly believe in your heart who he is, the Christ, the one and only son of God, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, performed many miracles, died on the cross for sins, rose again on the third day, the only life bringer that there is. When you believe that in your heart, you will be saved. Because with your heart, you believe under righteousness. And with your mouth, confession is made into salvation. And it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Greek, a church girl or a criminal. It doesn't matter who you are. This is what it looks like. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And no, there's not a sinner's prayer that we write down on the back of a card that if you repeat, it's really the best way to do it. In fact, probably one of the best illustrations in Scripture of a salvation cry that I, that I see is found over in, in Matthew chapter 14. And in Matthew chapter 14, we get this Jesus walking on water, right? How many of y'all heard that story? The miracle of Christ walking out on water. He, his disciples had gone off onto the sea. They're out in the middle of the night. They're in this boat. Things a little rocky. All of a sudden they look and what seems like might be a ghost is walking across the top of the water toward them. They began to freak out a little bit, if you know what I mean. Because any of us would. And they see this image just walking toward them on the water. All of a sudden, that image begins to get clearer and clearer. And they notice that this is Jesus in the flesh, in his human flesh, walking upon the water. And Jesus is walking to them. When, when Peter recognizes that it is Jesus, Peter immediately, he jumps up and he says, Jesus, if it's you, command me to walk to you. Command me and I will walk out. I will walk on the water just like you to you. And the Bible says that Jesus said, let's go. And, and Peter jumps out of the water and begins to walk on the water. But all of a sudden, Right? He begins to look around. He takes his eyes off Jesus for a moment. And the cares of the world begin to just overpower him. He sees the wind and the waves, and he's not in the boat, and he has left his safety. 
And he's trying now to walk on the water in his flesh. See, before Jesus commanded it. And he was walking in the power of Christ. But now he is walking in his flesh. And he begins to sink and to drown. He begins to physically drown right there in the water. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 14, verse 30. But when he had saw the wind and he was afraid and he began to sing, he cried out, Lord, save me. That was it. No long, elaborate prayer. Lord, save me. And it reminds me today that anybody, anybody that is presented the word of God and receives the word of God and they feel the Holy Spirit begin to draw them in and they hear the fact that, yes, I'm a sinner and I fall short of his glory. But God in all of his love, he demonstrated that while I'm a sinner, Christ died for me. And I know that the wages of my sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, who gave his life for me, who lived a sinless life, was born of a virgin, died on the cross, but rose again on the third day so that I can have life. And I believe that. And the scripture tells me that if I will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and I truly believe in my heart that God's raised him from the dead, I'll be saved. Because with my heart, I believe unto righteousness that makes me right with God. My mouth confession is made of the salvation. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I'm a, a Jew or a Greek, a churchgoer or a criminal. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who I am because anyone that will call upon the name of Jesus to save them and believes those things and truly wants him as the Lord of their life, he's theirs. So today, maybe you sit here. Maybe you said a prayer one time. Maybe, maybe you just sort of went through the motions of baptism because that's what you thought you were supposed to do. Maybe you've done a bunch of religious acts, but the truth is you've, you have never cried out to God to say you, You've never really, it's never really registered within your soul who God is, who you are, and what God has done to save you. And maybe today it is registering for the very first time. And today you truly believe in your heart and you want to receive that grace that God is offering you through his son Jesus. The only way to respond your heart and with your lungs. Just Jesus, save me. And when you do, tell somebody. In a moment, you'll see uh, I'll be down front. I'm going to ask our elders to be in the back and, and just come grab somebody and say, hey, I've asked Jesus to save me today. Just tell us. We want to rejoice. We want to pray with you. We want to talk to you. Maybe you're here today. He said, Pastor, I wish somebody would have preached that message to me 20 years ago. I haven't done a great job in sharing the gospel in my home. I wish somebody would have shared that message with me 40 years ago. I haven't done a great job with sharing that message with my grandkids. I haven't done a great job with sharing that message. Yes, I'm saved and I know Jesus, but I fall into that trap of well with the pastor's I want to leave here today and be able to go to share that message with the people that I love with passion for who Jesus is. If that's you, we want to partner with you in that. We want to pray for you. We want to pray for those that you need to take that message to. 
So don't take advantage of this time. Don't walk out today just trying to walk out and say, well, maybe I can instill these things in my life. But let the church partner with you. Let us pray for you. So in a moment when we sing that song of response, as others respond out by crying out, Jesus, save me, why don't today you respond by just falling down in front of a holy God, asking him to forgive you because you haven't done a great job of sharing the gospel in your home and with your family, and to help you, give you the boldness to go home and to proclaim truly who Jesus is. Why don't you come and respond by partnering with the church in unity, saying, I need more of this. I need to hear this again. I need help. And let us help. Let that help start by us just praying with you so that you will have boldness and so that you can go home and do this. And praying that God will soften the hearts of those that the gospel is going to be delivered to. Heavenly Father, God, we, we love you and we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you. We thank you so much for godly parents and godly grandparents that like, like Lois and Eunice with Timothy, that they're constantly bringing up faith and bringing up Jesus, bringing up the gospel that it's being instilled in children's minds from the very beginning. But God, I know that that's not always the way. God, I know that, that, that that's not always how things work out. I know that it's easy to feel inadequate. I've been there before. I, I've stood in front of people as a youth leader and been there feeling inadequate. How am I going to share the gospel with anybody that comes to me? But God, through your spirit and word, you used me as a tool that day to bring the gospel to those young men. And the same way you used me, you can use anybody in this room to bring the gospel to their family, to bring the gospel to those that they love, to bring the gospel to those that they work with, to bring the gospel to those that they go to school with. You can use anybody in this room, Father, as long as we will just submit and allow the spirit that you have given us to work through us and allow your word to do its job. Father, I pray right now to those in this room that are convicted today. They're truly convicted about not sharing the gospel in their home. God, I pray that today they will make a, take a stance and make a commitment, not only to you, but make a commitment to the church. Tell the pastor, an elder, a deacon, that today I'm making a commitment and I want y'all to partner with me in this commitment to go home and to share the gospel. And Lord, I pray for those in this room that have truly never cried out to you before. Maybe they said a prayer and didn't even know what to believe. They're just repeating something after somebody. Maybe they were baptized but have no clue who you truly are, have no clue of what Jesus had done. And maybe today what they need to do is your word resonates in their heart as your spirit draws them in is just cry out today Jesus save me Jesus save me and receive the grace that you offer and receive the forgiveness that Christ paid for and Lord I pray and I ask that they do that today and I pray this in Jesus name